Bibles to 2 Timothy uh, chapter 3, uh, and we'll be reading verses 1 to 5. And yeah, when you when you do put something together like this, you, you really do appreciate the, the work that goes in just week in, week out, and the work that goes on in this church of you know of what Pastor does, you know, having to preach three times a week here. Uh, and uh, it's hard work. And uh, yeah, I'm not sure if I could do it every week, but you know, I, I really appreciate it anyway, the, the stuff that goes on here. Anyway, let's go to Second Timothy and chapter three. Um, and the Bible reads in verse one, sorry. This know also, that in the last days perilous times shall come. For men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection, truce breakers, false accusers, incontinent, fierce, despised of those that are good, traitors, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God, having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof from such a way. Uh, and this is pretty describing the spiritual condition that we find out there in the world. I particularly want to draw your attention there in verse 4, where it says, lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God. You know, that's sort of, when I was reading this, and I was doing this sort of study, I, I, and, and what I'm going to be preaching about this morning is the subject of happiness. So if you want to title it, it's simply this, the truth about happiness. And on this list is just a bunch of stuff that is in the opposition to what I was teaching about happy. It's almost the exact opposite. So we'll be looking um, back and forth from 2 Timothy, and we'll just be seeing some of the devil's lies. So what I want to do this morning is go through, try and get through 10 points. I don't think Pastor could ever get through 10 points in one second. That's been my God. <laughs> so we're going to try and go through 10 uh, biblical truths about uh, what goes we if we live in the day and age, especially now in 2020, where the world is falling around down by our ears and, and chaos is reigning and anarchy seems to be rising up, and we just need to have a peace in our lives and a happiness as Christians. Uh, it's not necessarily true to say at the moment either. This is a sad fact that you know if you see a happy person, uh, that's automatically a Christian, and if you see a sad person, uh, yeah, yeah, that, that's a non-Christian. That's not the way it is. A little bit like uh, yeah, marriage is like that. You don't have to necessarily be a Christian to have a successful marriage. But all the truths of how to have a successful marriage and how to be happy are in the Bible. And, and one thing Pastor will say um, uh, about what separates our, our book, uh, our scriptures from other scriptures, is prophecy. And you know, while that is true, while our book contains pinpoint accuracy of, of, of truths that get fulfilled just time and time again, we know that we can trust. But not only that, not only do we have prophecy, it also has every word has power to find uh, truth. So we're able to go through the happiness. I, I think you'll be uh, yeah, surprised. And, uh, and you might not know all these truths of happiness that we find in the Bible, but they're there. And it's a sad, it's a sad thing as Christians that you know we. You know, I pray to be happy as a young man. It's one of the things I pray for. It's just a natural thing to receive God. They all like, you know, why not go through them? Why not find out and get as many blessings from God as we possibly can? Um, uh, so yeah, and also, you know, what is the point in being you know, a happy person your whole life, being nice to everyone that you meet, and you're having a successful marriage, and then going to hell of it uh, at the end of it? There really is no point. So that's what we're going to do today. We're gonna, we want fulfilled Christian lives, and uh, I, I want to start off by um, just defining what I mean by happiness. What do I even uh, mean there? So the, uh, I don't speak of the word Latin, for the sake of research, I, I looked up the word in Latin, and, and the word for happiness is contenere. Uh, the con, uh, at the beginning, means with, uh, and the tenere means to hold in or to contain. So just, you know, to hold in, you can see how that sort of relates to being satisfied, or it's very similar to the word content. And in Spanish, the word is contento, so we can see, you know, what it means. It means to be satisfied or content. And the opposite of being satisfied and content with, with your lot in life is to be covetous or to be lustful of things around you. So we don't want to be covetous. This is a sin in the Bible. We need to be content with what we have. What I'm not talking about is, uh, is just like this personality trait of just, trait of just being elated. Well, I always think about the, um, uh, the comic Robin Williams. You ever see him in interviews, and some of the young people might not have a clue who I'm talking about, but Robin Williams. In, in the 80s and the 90s, and sadly, a few years uh, ago, he took his life. And you know, I say it's sad because we don't want to see anyone uh, perish, even the wicked. We want to see them saved, don't we? That's, yeah, that's why we go out and evangelize. It's, it's all very sad. But 
you ever saw him in interviews, he would just seem like the most happiest, bubbliest person. He'd be bouncing off the walls. But, you know, someone with a bit of discernment would, would see that there's something wrong there. And of course it was. You know, he was addicted to drugs. He was addicted to alcohol. He had a very you know, miserable life. And that is not where happiness comes from. Whatever he had, if it was success, if it was fame, you know, he wasn't a happy person. He was a very sad person. And, you know, so I'm not talking about uh, just necessarily the outward appearance. Being content comes from... Uh, from within. Um, and also before I get into the, the main body of the message, I also want to just say that the government has got a vested interest in keeping us unhappy, keeping us um, to not be content. They want us covetous because they make money from us being uncontent. It drives the economy if we're constantly looking to buy the next car or do upgrade and just, you know, we just need to be happy with our lot in life, don't we? Um, and, and also, yeah, if you put happiness and, and uh, love as a pleasure rather than love as God, if you put that as your main focus in life, uh, then that is often going to cause you to, to fall into sin. And eventually, you know what happens with sin? It causes us to be unhappy because it causes problems in our life. And, you know, God does not want us to be unhappy. You know, the government wants us to be unhappy, but God doesn't. He wants us to be blessed in this life. So before we get into the main body of Scripture, let's just go ahead and, uh, and pray. Dear Heavenly Father and Lord God, I so thank you for your word, Lord, and thank you so much that we have something to sing about this morning, Lord, and we're out there singing your praises, Lord. We're so grateful that we uh, have all these blessings that we can just read through your word, Lord. We just need to realize that we need to pick up your word and read it day and just find all these truths that can be a blessing to us, Lord. I pray that this message will calm people's hearts this morning, Lord, help them not to be anxious in this world that we find ourselves in, and and I pray that we're just a blessing this morning, Lord. And we give you the honour and the glory and all the praise this morning. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right, so ten points to get through. I'm going to have to work pretty quick here this morning. Uh, but if you would, for our first one, we could turn to Proverbs 16.20. In your Bibles, Proverbs 16.20. Proverbs 16, 20 then. And point number one is just to trust in the Lord. You'll see this over and over again in the Bible, but in Proverbs 16, 20, the Bible reads, He that handeth the matter wisely shall find good, and whosoever trusteth in the Lord is he. So you can see that the trusting in the Lord is going to create, is going to cause us to be happy. Well, there's a couple of ways you can look at this. Whenever you think about trusting in the Lord, number one, you know, you, Instantly, your mind is drawn to salvation. Just trusting in the Lord for salvation can instantly make you a happy person. Now, if you think about it, you've been passed from death unto life. You have the anxiety of not knowing where you go when you die. You have, you know, you've been spared hell, haven't you? That makes make you to be a happy person in, in general. But then number two, the second way to look at this is, you know, you need to trust in the Lord also for everything else. I mean, yeah, it's, it's vague. I can't get too deep in this this morning. But when you, when you trust in the Lord for everything else, having an authority in your life, having the authority of the King James Bible is going to take her off some of the pressure off yourself because you haven't got to do everything in your own wisdom anymore. You can use the authority of this, of this book, of the Word of God, and, and all of a sudden it, takes, it lifts a lot of pressure off, doesn't it? Because if you make some mistakes in life or, and it's on your own head, then you're the one that's going to have to uh, be accountable for that. But when it's God to do something, then, you know... You can just relax about things. Uh, but, but not only did he give us the authority of his word, he also gave us other authorities in our life. So we might have, you know, civil government ruling and reigning over us. And, you know, while we haven't got the best uh, government, it's not a righteous government, it's better to have no government. You know, we have an authority and we want to stay on the right side of the law. We're not anarchists. We don't believe in going out and, and causing mayhem. And while we don't want anarchy on the streets, we also don't want anarchy in our homes. And that is why God gave us... Um, uh, a structure in the home of authority um, and, and if we're trusting in the word of God then we have to trust in the other authorities that you put there so we've got governor and we've got dad in the home you know, we, we don't want to uh, be constantly uh, at strife in our homes and our families and you know, when you know, my children you know, do as they say and, and Martha's only really the, the only one that <laughs> you know, can do that which is right and, and, and obey her dad you know, things get on pretty well we have a peaceful home but of course you know as children do, they want to, they want to rebel, and, and we do also against the Lord. 
people. We, we need to conform. We need to get into authority. Her life is going to be so much better when she just does as Daddy says. <laughs> and when Daddy's not around, then obviously Mum's in charge. She needs to do what Mummy says. This is going to make her, her life easier. Uh, yeah, also, we have the institution of the church. And pastor has authority within the church. And we do. don't need to be constantly striving with our pastor and not getting on with him. Now, if we just allow the authority in our lives, this is going to cause us to be less anxious because of the fact that we're not just, just not everything's on us all the time. So you can see, number one, the trusting in the Lord is going to help us to be happy. Um, point number two. Uh, now, I'm not going to make you turn to every point just for the sake of time this morning because I've got a lot to get through. So num number two is enduring. And in James 5.11, uh, the Bible uh, says that we count them happy which endure. And this uh, fact of enduring, all of a sudden, doesn't it isn't immediately obvious that this is going to cause happiness. But I definitely uh, you know, spent a lot of time pondering this as I read through it, and I thought about this a long time. And the more I thought about it, I was like, yeah, the endurance definitely helps us to be happy people. Uh, yeah, the, um, uh, number one, reading Bibles can be an endurance. You pick it up. First couple of times, it's easy to read through. We'll just be reading through this thing day in, day out, just year upon year, just, just crunching through. You know, the Bible can sometimes seem like an endurance, it can seem heavy going. And our spiritual life sometimes, you know, just getting out and evangelizing and doing things right and doing things for the Lord, and just our spiritual walk in general can sometimes seem like an endurance. And we just have to sometimes just get through it. But yeah, you know, the fruit of that long term is going to give us happiness because of you know, the fruit that we get from reading our Bibles. You know, marriage the same way. Now, I've got a spoiler alert. You know, I'm not a perfect person, and my wife is not a perfect person, and when two perfect people getting together, you know, there, there's a marriage there, and it's an imperfect marriage. And you know, sometimes, you know, this is a terrible time for you guys. That is, <laughs> you know, marriage is hard, and sometimes you have to endure it. And so, you know, some people just get up to year one. You know, they, they get out, and, and as soon as something hard comes along, they don't endure it their marriage, if they want to get out and people get divorced, it's a very sad thing, God hates putting away, very sad thing, but you know, the blessings come from working through that and doing the long term, and, and, and the love between a husband and a wife can grow and develop and blossom, but you know, if you just want to give up, you know, the devil's off, off on your shoulder saying you need to give up, you need to get out of this thing, you, you put way harder than anybody else in this marriage, and that's sad, and, and, and often people listen to that, but we need to stay married because the Bible is, yeah, it's, it's a con marriage is a contract, isn't it? And, and we, it's between a, a husband and wife, and it's also between God. We, we have a vow with God, and we need to keep our vows whenever we make a vow with God. Yeah, also, what about running a physical race? This can be an effort endurance, isn't it? It's not necessarily pain-free. It's hard as we're running through, and we're, you know, we're struggling, and our lungs are on fire, and our legs are aching. You're running through it. Um, yeah, it's hard, but where does the happiness come from? A, a, a achieving it, it's at the end, isn't it? We, we, we feel a sense of accomplishment. Yeah, uh, whenever I'm running, yeah, I, I constantly think, myself, I need to start this. Is this is too much? <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, endurance. Yeah, being being enduring, uh, soldier for the Lord, enduring uh, through, through through our vows and our marriages, and just more, and more like a physical kind of sense. You know, running, running a race. So, uh, point number three then, and, and as I say, you know, this morning this overview, obviously I can't go super deep into every subject, but I just want to get you know, one place that we can go, you know, how to be happy, you know, we've got ten points here, this is just an overview, so we're just going to work our way through it. Number three is being disciplined. Turn to Job 5.17. Turn to, uh, yeah, Job 5.17. Job 5.17 reads, Behold, happy is the man whom God correcteth, therefore despise not thou the chastening of the Almighty. Now that doesn't seem like something that you would automatically assume of making us happy is correction. But again, it's a long thing, it's the fruit. You know, you're on a wrong path, God needs to correct you, he puts you on the right path. And that's sometimes you know, why we need to discipline our children. You know, this also teaches me that correcting and disciplining our children is going to make them happier. And that's what we want from, 
Yeah, we want to, we want, we want our children to be happy, or we want to be happy. Yeah, but obviously the chastening of the Almighty. Yeah, this is something that goes to His sons and to His children. So it's just a good way to know that you're saved when you're, you're constantly, uh, you know, being rebuked by the Lord, and, and you know, things might not always go your way. He doesn't always give us uh, a smooth run of things. Uh, but yeah, obviously God wants us. Uh, sorry, God wants us to be disciplined you know, in, in every aspect of our lives. You know, t- you know turning up on time for work, having a uh, you know, disciplined mind, bringing our, our, our thoughts into subjection to the to the uh, but, but the devil does not want us to be um, disciplined. Yeah, he wants us to be debauched and sinful, and just however he can derail us, he will. But no, we need to stay on track, we need to stay on our course, we need to do that which is right and, uh, and make sure that everything that we do is disciplined. Uh, you know, these liberals don't seem happy to me. They're, they're always the, one of the ones on the pills, aren't they? Because, you know, but you know, they'll preach to you all day long. And I'm here to tell you this morning, the Bible teaches us that we need to be corrected and we need to be disciplined. And, we, and you know, this is a part of our sanctification of discipline, where we just try every day to to keep our vow, to do that which is right, you know, to, 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 to do what we say we're going to do, and just be a, a disciplined people. Um, turn to Psalms 100, no, actually, I, I won't make you turn to this one, because, you know, just for sake of time, uh, I'll just go for a few here, but number four is, is having a, a family, having loved ones, and the Bible reads, and this is something that Pastor quoted to me when, um, uh, uh, when we did Martha's dedication. Uh, but Psalm 127, verse 4 and 5 says, As our are in the hand of a mighty man, so are children of the youth. Happy is the man that hath his quiver full of them. And this is talking about having a big family. And whatever you know, God means for a blessing, you know, if we don't follow God's way, this will easily turn into a curse. And uh, yeah, I, I won't mention his name, but there was a comedian out there that said, you know, I always wanted three children. But now I had two. I wish I had none. <laughs> And that's the, yeah, that, is the, that is the way the world is. I mean, they see co- children as a curse. But if we raise them up you know, in the godly way, uh, you know, you know, to, be, to be fearing of, of authority in their lives and, and just to be pleasant, uh, then children can very much uh, be a blessing to, to us. Now, and I realize that not everyone, else, not everyone out there is in a position uh, where, where they're at that uh, stage in life where they've been family. You know, it's hard for some people. But um, to turn to Mark 3.31, if you would. Mark 3, chapter 3, verse 31, reads, There came then his brethren, and this is, this is Jesus we're talking about, There came then his brethren and his mother, and standing without, sent unto him, calling him. And the, the multitude sat about him, and they said unto him, Behold, my mother and thy brethren without seek for thee. And he answered them, saying, Who is my mother or my brethren? And he looked round about on them which sat about him, and said, Behold, my mother and my brethren, for, for whosoever shall do the will of God, the same as my brother and my sister and my mother. And this is just, you know, talking about our spiritual family. We have a family here at New Hope Baptist Church. You know, if you're not at that stage, you're like, yeah, and you might have a wicked friend. That's obviously an awful thing if that has, but, you know, you can come and you can invest in families and relationships in church and just grow, um, yeah, just grow a, a portfolio of friends and family in your local church. Just build that up. But hopefully God will bless you with a family and a, and a large family at that. Because we don't want to go, you know, we don't want to follow the world's pattern of just saying, you know, that you know, we're destroying um, the earth of people. And, and maybe the heathen are. But us Christians, you know, if we're right and we know how to raise our children, we need to have large families and repopulate the earth. Repopulate this church. Wouldn't it be wonderful? We just be able to repopulate. If we can't get them from, <laughs> from evangelizing, let's build our own church from within. A homegrown church. I like that idea. <laughs> okay. Uh, uh, point number five uh, is is labour. It's working hard. Uh, turn to Proverbs twenty eight twenty two. Proverbs twenty eight twenty two in your Bible. And while you're turning there, I'll read to you from Psalms one hundred twenty eight verse two. So you're turning to twenty eight twenty two, and I'm reading from Psalm one hundred twenty eight verse two. For thou shalt eat the labour of thine hand, happy shalt thou be, and it shall be well with thee. Now, I'm a big advocate of 
laboring as in working from the sweat of your brow, having a physically active job. Because to me, it just seems so counter yeah, intuitive to be you know, spending 40 or 50 hours a week uh, you know, working and then having to go and do extra exercise. You know, obviously, I realize that everyone is not able to, to, have, to have a job where they're working the sweat of their brow and you, know, you have liberty in Christ to, to choose whatever job you want to do. But you know, I like to feel tired at the end of the day. That helps me to sleep. And uh, yeah, my, my grand, she, she was a very wise woman. She, she, was, say, she, she, went to, she was a missionary for, for our Africa, and she was a great um, inspiration for me. And she'd always quote to me verses from the King James Bible, and even though sadly towards the end she got derailed onto the new King James, and, and uh, yeah, she wouldn't listen to my correction. She was a very wise woman. Anyway, she'd always uh, you know, be able to uh, give me these uh, verses from the King James Bible that she had memorized, because she said that the new King James wasn't as easy to memorize. <laughs> Isn't that interesting that she could always remember, she'd always have the King James to remember us. But she always said to me that, you know, in order to sleep well, um, you need to work hard, eat well, and have a clear conscience. And that was always such great advice to me. Just having a clear conscience is going gonna, is gonna to help you sleep well. And sleep, yeah, if you don't have lack of sleep, so if you have lack of sleep, it's going to cause you to be grouchy and unhappy, and, and we don't want that. You know, in regards to working hard, to enjoy your job as well. Think about, you know, if you're spending all this time at your job, you know, you want to be good at it because it's going to help you to enjoy it. And if you're spending all that time, uh, you know, just in one place or, you know, doing, doing one career path, then you just need to be enjoying that job. And that's, that's how you're going to get there, it's just by working hard at it and doing the best job you can. Because, you know, you know as a child of God, you, know, you want to be seen to be doing the best job you can. It's a good testimony to others, others around you if you're working hard. No one's going to trust you on the gospel. We need to work hard. It's going to cause us to be happy. But yeah, you know, again, the devil's lie is just like you know, you take it easy, you know, chill out today. You're not supposed to experience any pain in your life. You know, this is what the devil wants us to believe, but you know, it isn't true. Point number six this morning is gratitude. Turn to Psalms 144. It's always so sad to me when you, you, you think about, you know, there's lots of old people and they'll be sat in their house today and they'll be depressed and they'll be looking out the window and they'll oh, sit so unfair. And they've got a King James Bible on their shelf probably because it's been passed down to them and they've never actually picked it up and read the thing. And it's sad to think about all those people just sitting there with the answer to happiness on their bookshelf and just never giving it a second thought. That's, that, that always strikes me as a, you know, a very sad thing to think about, isn't it? Um, so where are we? We are in Psalms 144 and verses 14 and 15. The Bible reads, That our oxen be strong to labour, that there be no breaking in nor going out, that there be no complaining in our streets. Happy is that people. That is in such a case, yea, happy is that people whose God is the Lord. Um, now, it's interesting that it mentions complaining in our streets, that there be no complaining in our streets, yea, happy those people. We should not be a complaining people. We need to have gratitude. We need to have, be thankful for what we have in life and the things that have got, God's given us. And you know, whenever we talk about complaining in our streets, we always instantly think of the children of Israel, don't we? Uh, walking in the wilderness for 40 years. You, you know the story. They're led out of, um, uh, of Egypt by Moses and they, they crossed the Dead Sea, and uh, which is a, a very interesting um, Simply to our spiritual walk, you know, we were once living in Egypt, and then we go out to a neat uh, wilderness where we just have to rely on Jesus Christ for everything, and you know that the manna is represented of, of the uh, of the flesh of Jesus Christ there. Uh, and I actually empathise with the children of Israel in this story because they've gone, you know, they they wanted to go back into Egypt, didn't they? This made God very mad. But they were walking around. They yeah, they had this tabernacle that they had to set up and pull down, and they didn't really know when they'd be on the move again. And you know how the story goes, they, they, they led in, in the daytime by a, a, pillar, a pillar of cloud, and in the night by a pillar of fire, and that thing could just start moving any time, they didn't really know. For 40 years, they were just in this place where, you know, they have to set everything up, set everything down, it was just a cost. So they ended up being complaining, and this made Moses pretty mad, but it made God pretty mad. So even under tough circumstances, 
you know, we need to be grateful for everything that we have. You know, if we've got a home, if we've got a roof over our head, you know, if we've got food in the cupboards, you know, be grateful for what you've got. You know, we're all at different stages of life, and you know, maybe we'll, God will bless you down the road at some other point. You know, if you don't feel like you've got as much as the next person, and we need to not be looking over at the next person and saying, well, they've got so much more than me, or the, you know, the, the, there's always someone worse off than ourselves. And we need to be thankful for what God has given us. You know, those children of Israel. You know, for 40 years, they weren't even allowed to go and see the promised land because of their unbelief. I mean, they had a bad attitude. And we need to make sure that we learn from that story and, and not be ungrateful for things. And, and also, yeah, in that uh, Second Timothy passage in, in chapter number three there, uh, it, it describes those people as being unthankful. You know, we don't want to be unthankful. We want to have a heart of gratitude. But this is a very easy easy one to, to link to happiness because we're thankful for everything. It's going to cause you to be, be grateful and to be happy and, and that's what we want to get. We want to be happy. Amen. Number seven, then. Uh, number seven is growing in wisdom. Turn to Proverbs chapter three. Proverbs chapter three and verse. 13, and we're going to read through to the end of verse 19. In Proverbs chapter 3 and verse 13, the Bible reads, Happy is the man that findeth wisdom, and the man that getteth understanding. For the merchandise of it is better than the merchandise of silver, and the gain thereof than fine gold. She is more precious than the roof, for the canst desire not to be compared unto her. Length of days is in her right hand, and in her left hand riches and honour. Her ways are ways of pleasantness, and all her paths of peace. She is a tree of life to them that lay hold upon her, and happy is everyone that retaineth her. For the Lord by wisdom hath founded the earth, by understanding hath he established the heavens. So, number seven is growing in wisdom. Now you can think of all the things that you already know that make you happy. Just, just the, the, the kind of, you, know, you might be able to speak another language, or you might be able to play an instrument. These are things that give us happiness. But, but more than that, you know, we have uh, the, the spiritual truths that we can find in the Bible. Um, I always like the, the phrase that, uh, or the saying that says, it's better to be at the bottom of a ladder that you want to climb than halfway up one that you don't. As in, you know, there's, there's the wisdom of this world, and you can get pretty far in the wisdom of this world and, be, and say some pretty stupid things at the end of it if, if you haven't built um, your wisdom on the rock, on, on the Word of God. Because... It, you know, all these super intelligent high IQ professors and stuff, they contradict one another because they haven't based their foundation of wisdom on the solid rock of the truth of the Word of God. You know, wisdom, as we know, and uh, uh, knowledge, it, it can puff up, it can sometimes be a bad thing. In Ecclesiastes, you'll see the word knowledge uh, coupled up with the word sorrow. And, you know, what's true? Does, does wisdom and knowledge make us happy or does it make us sorrowful? Well, both are true, you know, and often you'll find this in the Bible, it appears like a contradiction, but if you work through it and actually uh, spend some time thinking about it, you'll see it's perfect, both things are true, God's teaching both sides of the same coin here. I mean, just think about salvation, you know, when you first get saved and you, you, you're just full of the joys of spring, you're walking around, and, uh, and, and all of a sudden, you know, while you're happy that you've been saved, it suddenly dawns on you. That means that some of your family might go to hell, or some of your work colleagues, or your, or your friends, or your school friends, or whatever. Uh, and that can cause you to be sorrowful, especially when you think, oh, well, I know the solution to this. I can just go and show them the gospel, and then listen to it. You know, it's, it's, it, that can be sorrowful. So you can see right there with doctrine number one in Christianity uh, that, that it's both true. You have uh, joy from that wisdom, and you also have sorrow. Um, think about with um, you know, wisdom, you know, all the right choices that you're going to make if you have wisdom. Uh, it's going to cause you to make better choices in life uh, and make the right, you know, go down the right roads. And you know, knowledge is, uh, you know, is, under, is understanding stuff, but, but wisdom is really knowing what to do with that, that knowledge. So, growing in knowledge. So, if we can have a quick recap. So, we've got trusting in the Lord, enduring, we've got being disciplined. We've got family, we've got working hard, we've got number six is gratitude, and then we have number seven, growing in knowledge. So we're, we, we're getting there, we're working our way through the list. How are we doing for time? <laughs> 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 oh, number eight, then. 
Number eight is generosity. The Bible reads, um, the, the Bible, sorry, the Bible says that it's more blessed to give than to receive. Uh, we know that, but it also says that he that hath mercy on the poor, happy is he. Being merciful and giving is going to be something that's going to make us happy because of the fact that God wants to bless us when we give. Um, in let's let's turn there. Let's turn to Matthew six, if you would. Turn to Matthew chapter six. And verse 3. But when thou doest alms, let not thy left hand know thy right hand, that thine alms may be in secret. And thy fa father which seeth in secret himself shall reward thee openly. So this is talking about when we give and when, we, when we're generous to do these things in secret because we want to be blessed by God publicly. I mean, don't, doesn't anyone want to be blessed by God publicly? That surely is going to make us you know, happier people when we're being rewarded by the Lord. Now, you often see people there, they're running a marathon, and they'll be, you know, dressed up like a, you know, whatever, a, a clock tower or something, or something ridiculous. You know, there's, there's nothing necessarily specifically wrong about raising money for charity, but the Bible says that they have their reward. And, you know, you can, you can do nice things, and it's okay to be to doing things, but if you want to receive the blessing of God, then you need to uh, be doing these things in secret. Don't let your left hand know what your right hand is doing. So we need to have mercy on the poor. We also need to find out who the poor are also. You know, the poor and the lazy aren't the same, one and the same. You know? If someone doesn't, if a man doesn't work, then neither should he eat, the Bible says. And, you know, we, do, we need to find out who the poor are. You know, the poor are people that want to uh, do well in life. And they're not just uh, lay about, so addicted to drugs and alcohol. It's very sad, but they need to get themselves out of that situation. And, uh, but, but we need to find out who the poor are. It's not just people that just don't want to work. Um, so yeah, we just need to we need to find ways of helping, being blessing to the people, and, and being blessing to our families, to our friends, and the church. And, and this is going to uh, create a happiness in our lives. Number nine, then, and this is a more of a general one. Number nine is to Proverbs twenty-eight verse fourteen says, "Happy is the man that feareth always." Well, if you're Fearing always. Now, if you do a study of fear in the Bible, you'll, you'll come to the same conclusion that I did, is that it's always right to fear the Lord, and it's always wrong to fear everything else. We shouldn't be fearing everything else in this world, because we need to be fearing the Lord. And once you have your fear put in the correct place, and that's fearing God, you're automatically not going to fear the other things in this world. And when you hear Christians just going about how angst they are about everything, and how they feel so down, and, and you know, the, the, you know in 2020, it's a time that you automatically want to be anxious. But hang on a minute. Aren't we supposed to fear God and fear his statutes and fear his laws and, and just follow and do what he says? Then you know, you're not going to be anxious. So when I see a Christian that says that you know, they're telling they're anxious, it just tells me that they're not fearing the Lord. And, and that's such a sad thing. In Proverbs 29, 18, the Bible says, Where there is no vision, the people perish. But he that keepeth the law, happy is he. And that's what sin is, it's a tradition of the law. So we need to find out, yeah, it's really important that we read our Bible to find out what is even right and wrong. Don't just leave it up to us to be teaching you week in and week out, because it's a, it's a big Bible, and we need, to, we need to see what God wants for our lives. We need to be, you know, staying as true as we can, doing that which is right, because blessing and cursing, they even, that's, that's where we come from, is the law. You know, how do we get blessed? We do that which is right. What's going to cause to be cursed is falling into sin. It's doing that which is wicked. Sin will destroy your life. <laughs> it's, it's, this, is, this should be an obvious point for anyone. You know? And, and you know, the devil's lie is so strong out there in young people's lives that they just think it's living for pleasure is the right thing to do. And living sinful, debauched lives is going to make them happy. And it doesn't. And you know, you, the older I get, the more you see it. And, and it's sad to see people's life being destroyed by sin. And they, they honestly don't think it's got anything to do with their wicked life. <laughs> you know, you know, if you don't get married, if you don't do all the things that God asks you to do, have children within the confines of a marriage, it's going to cause you know, families to be broken up and, and, and cause misery. And we do not want that for people. So we lovingly try and show them from the Word of God how they're 
Sarah, but of course, they often make us out to be bad guy, you know, <laughs> you know rubbing their noses in it or whatever. And, and that isn't the intention. You know, we just want people to live right and just to, to, to live successful, fulfilled lives. Um, okay, so that, yeah, that's kind of an ob obvious one. Number 10, you know, earlier on, I, I, at the beginning of the sermon, I sort of talked about, you know, being a Christian. Not, not all of these points, you even need be a Christian for, but number 10 you definitely need to be a Christian for, because number 10 the point is suffering for the cause of Christ. Now you need to be a Christian in order to suffer for the cause of Christ, and when bad things happen to you and, and you get, you know, um, uh, you, you go for a bit of tribulation, the Bible has got some promises here, you can be happy through that. So turn if you would now to 1 Peter chapter 3. And verse 14, and the Bible reads, But and if ye suffer for righteousness' sake, happy are ye, and be not afraid of their terror, neither be troubled. So for suffering for righteousness' sake is something that we should actually be happy for. Again, we didn't put ourselves into that situation. We're just being obedient unto Christ. And now whatever the situation is, you know, it, you know, if, you, if your wife's left you or your husband's walked out on you because you, you've been following them in, in, in your are really suffering for the cause of Christ, well, the Bible says that you can, have, you can be happy. Now, we might not need this instant gratification in this life. We have to have faith and trust in the life to come. You know, he promises everlasting life. He promises a crown of righteousness. Not that we are, but the suffering of Jesus Christ. You know, he's going to make sure that we are blessed. And we're laying up treasures right there in heaven for when we suffer. Now, we don't want to necessarily just destroy our lives and have uncomfortable lives here. Of course we don't. But at the end of the day, when we are expected to, to suffer for Christ, even, even under the Bible, you know, that's the most extreme form of, of sacrifice and, and suffering, then we, that's what we need to do. And we need to be happy in our tribulations and happy when we're being persecuted and, and happy if the world hates us because rest assured it's going to, if you stand up for the things of truth and the things of the word, you know, evil people naturally hate those things. And again, that's something that cropped up, if you remember, in, in uh, 2 Timothy um, chapter 3. Um, just a page over to your right in uh, 1 Peter chapter 4 and verse 14, it says, If you are approached for the name of Christ, happy are ye, for the spirit of glory and of God resteth upon you. On their part he is evil spoken of, but on your part he is glorified. Yeah, even if you've been reproached, yeah, you just need to be happy. Yeah, you just need to be safe in the knowledge that Jesus Christ loves you. And nothing that I've said here is more important than the doctrine of salvation. Point number one, you just need to trust in Jesus Christ and, and, and have him as your saviour. Now, the devil's lie there, you know, you, you've got suffering. He, he teaches you that you shouldn't really feel any suffering. You shouldn't go through any, any pain. You shouldn't sacrifice anything. But if you'd asked me at 20 years old what I'd be doing now, I wouldn't have said I'd be here doing this. You know, I wanted to be making it in the cleaning industry. I wanted to be taking the world by storm, um, you know, have, have Exeter on fire and you know, with, with a great restaurant, have my name up in life. But that's not what God wanted for my life. You know, it just wasn't. So, you know, I can't have done my ideas beforehand. God's got a much better path for me. You know, he's blessed me greatly and I'm so grateful to him. And, and sometimes you just need to have the faith in God just to do whatever he says because he will bless you along with not always financially, but he's going to make sure that you're going to be a happy, happy person you know, and a blessed person. Um, a, a couple of things that didn't make it um, into the level of, of the devil's lie of, of what he wants in our life. Um, one of the things that, and it, this has started growing more ground in the last few years, is the... Um, is, is the uh, the false doctrine of mindfulness. There's nothing wrong with being mindful or being caring about other people or thinking things through with your mind, but mindfulness is a doctrine from Eastern mysticism, and it comes over from Buddhism, and it basically, yeah, it, it basically teaches you just to focus in on, and it, what, what it's basically doing is setting, setting yourself up uh, um, into self-worship and being your own god. We need to uh, avoid the devil's lies, and if you're reading your Bible constantly, you're not going to fall into these sort of traps, but 
Whenever you meet these people, they're the most anxious people I've ever met. Have you ever met someone that's really into Eastern mysticism? They're usually single because their marriage breaks down and wraps around them. Because guess what? Blessings do not come from them. They come from God. They come from the true God of the Bible. And he's the one that we need to look for. And he's the... Yeah, we stay on his right side if we want to receive blessing from the Lord, don't we? And whilst throwing this list together of ten things, we worked our way through to ten points there. Yeah, I, I kind of had some ideas in my head of what makes me happy. And what I, what I had to do, I had to remove those ideas. And I had to go for what the Bible says. And, that, and that's the right way to approach the Bible, by the way. We need to throw out what we think what makes us happy. And goes with what the Bible says. Because as Pastor often says, yeah, he knows us better than we know ourselves. And you know, one of the things that I, I thought... Surely exercise is going to make it on the list. Yeah, that yeah, seems to maybe be making a lot of people happy. But what about the people that can't exercise? Yeah, it is wisdom you put endurance there because you might do endure these things. Or, you know, what about you know, for, for single people? You know, they might have to endure that period of life where they have to be single. Uh, and so, so God has a, a wisdom here. We, don't, we need to throw out what we think and just go for what the Bible says every single time. You know, healthy food might make you a happier person, but the, the, the fact of the matter is some people might not have access to healthy food. But, you know, it would be a, a, saying, or a sad day when we have access to the Word of God. And, you know, why, why go through this? Is, it just, uh, is this just to make us feel, feel good and better about ourselves? Well, it, it does have that effect, and, and I hope it has, had, it has had that effect for you this morning. But, you know, being happy, if you think about it, is going to make you a better job. It's going to make you a more productive employee. Yeah, it's going to make you a better wife or a better husband, a better son and, or a better daughter. And it's going to make you a better child of God. It's going to make you a more stable person. And that's what we need to be doing with our lives, is finding ways that we can be stable, going out in boldness, preaching the word of God, changing, building people's uh, uh, lives up with the gospel, because... The, the world is going to hell, and it, it's sad for me to see that. You know, you see these young kids come into church or after the bus ministry, and you think, what hope have they got if they haven't got the gospel, if they haven't got Jesus in their life? Are they just going to be patterned after the generations that are before them that have rejected the word of God? Or is there hope there to fulfill happy life? So you know, I hope it's been a blessing to you this morning. You know, God has got the power to bless and to curse at the end of the day. We need to... Uh, you know, see what he has to say. We have to trust in him. And if you remember the story of David, um, you know when he, when he looks over at Bathsheba, you know, God actually took away his joy for doing that because he he did a wicked thing. Yeah, he wasn't perfect. Yeah, he was a great man of God, and he did a very very many mighty works for the Lord. And for that, we can you know be grateful for the example that he left us. But you know, we we don't want to follow in his footsteps of sin. And I don't want my children to follow in my simple footsteps. You know, I want them to 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 um, you know, change change their path, be corrected by the Lord, um, so they can live a happy and fulfilled life. And uh, and that brings us to the end. I'm just gonna just just pray at the end of the, at the end of this message. And uh, dear Heavenly Father, I, I do thank you so much for everything, for every blessing you've got this morning, Lord. I pray that I was a blessing to the people that heard it, that they could go out here being happier. So they can live more fulfilled lives, Lord. Show them they don't need to be anxious and scared of, uh, of everything that uh, is around the corner, Lord. They can just bear faith and trust in you, Lord. We need to be careful of these things, Lord, and be careful to fear you. And Jesus, we thank you. Amen. Amen. Amen.